So uh, you can see my title here. Um, it, it will already give you an, um, an idea what I'm going to talk about. And for this talk, I'm deeply indebted to the pioneers in the field, uh, like Joanna Drucker, Jeffrey Schnapp, and Lev Manovic, on whose thoughts and publications I will draw upon. I would like to start with two propositions. I think it can be said that Firstly, for most film archives are not sufficiently equipped to meet the increasing demands of the public for access of their collections, only a minute fraction of, uh, of which have today been digitized and made available in digital form. Uh, there is an estimation in 2012 that only 1.5% of the collections of the uh, audiovisual archives have been digitized, and I think it's not a lot more now. Secondly, there is not a lot of research done within the digital humanities when it comes to audiovisual material, especially when we compare it with the efforts made in text analysis. So what could be the reasons for this neglection of film within the digital humanities while, and this is one of my hypotheses, the amount and also the complexity of the data one can find in an average film certainly would call for the use of digital tools. In my talk, I will try to outline some of the potential benefits, not only for film studies, but also for film archives. These two areas are inherently related, because film in particular is in most cases a multimedia, collaborative and performative artwork, which encompasses all image, audio, text, and usually many secondary sources, links, a link to its production, promotion, and presentation. One of the reasons for the comparatively scarce engagement is for sure the lack of access to primary and secondary sources, and even more significant, the lack of meaningful content descriptions within the available databases. Lastly, the relationship between um, film archives and the academia is, I would say, not without friction. Traditionally, archives have to fulfill a dual role. Not only do they preserve and provide access to the collections, with the data being provided through online or offline databases, but they also engage with them on a content-based level. Therefore, archives, or more generally collecting institutions, often have historians, art historians, or humanities scholars among their staff. Despite the fact that, even though archivists and scholars still tend to be placed in separate camps by university, there is actually very little that separates uh, them from what we, cons what we uh, would consider traditional scholars, especially among the current generation of emerging archivists. Schnapp and Presner in their Digital Humanities Manifesto 2.0 rightfully point out that a great amount of research is indeed carried out within libraries and archives, but it can be said that the traditional hier hierarchies are still very deeply rooted in people's minds. So let's sum up the situation as I see it at the moment. I should probably... So you have something else to look on <laughs> while I continue. These are uh, two, um, two alternative titles uh, to, my, to my presentation. So I wanted to sum up the situation as I see it at the moment. So the digital humanities are still very much text-oriented. Judging from the articles in the Digital Humanities Quarterly related to the topic since its beginning, because I did not find any article uh, that actually dealt with uh, film studies, in my own experience from conferences in Digital Humanities. Film archives are quite isolated within their own cultural heritage environment and community, and the film scholars still sometimes struggle to be taken seriously among their humanity peers. All these three communities are not very well connected. So it's not a good start for proposing conference papers, or maybe a very good start, uh, starting point for collaborations for those who are interested in challenge on every level. Let me also start uh, with textual descriptions and paper documents. So I will have to talk about metadata a little bit. Uh, I hope you stay with me. It's something that is uh, extremely important among cultural heritage institutions, of course, uh, because basically, uh, if you don't have, this is already a summary probably of what I will try to tell you now. If you don't have good metadata, nobody will find your objects and you're therefore not visible at all. Since the emergence of film, not only the main artwork has been published and disseminated, but it has been accompanied by film-related materials. These consist of a heterogeneous collection of media types and documents, such as handwritten charts, scripts, photos, posters, or something very um, 
something as exotic as an EPK, which you probably have never heard of. It's an electronic press kit. But these things are, uh, can be found in archives, really, by, by the thousands. Another example of filmic paratexts are cinema advertisements in newspapers or ads for cinematographic equipment in film journals. Documents like these contextualize the performative art of cinema, not only for the professional peers and scholars, but also for the film audience. The latest developments in the field of social media, posts, blogs, likes, etc., multiply the amount of potential data and sources which offer researchers points of departure. The aforementioned diversity of data still presents a challenge for film scholars when it comes to the diligent and comprehensive online research. On one hand, the digitized documents are scattered among different websites which can be accessed and, re and searched in similarly different ways. Although libraries and archives do their best under their restricted financial circumstances to digitize parts of their, collect of their holdings and make them available for their users. However, there is not a single entry point where scholars can start their investigations and are directed to useful sources. It seems an impossible task to look through all the relevant websites in different languages to find information on a film title, director, or a topic. This is true for the film historian examining newspaper articles for a special period, as well as a film scholar trying to trace the contemporary dis discussion on a fairly recent film. In both cases, it would be helpful to be able to search across uh, different platforms, media formats, data types, and time periods. On the other hand, the available material comes in various formats and diverse qualities. More often than not, the scans are not OCR searchable or the websites lack useful search options altogether. When I presented a computer scientist with this problem, his first question was, what is the query? Is it a film title? Is it a sequence? Or could it be uh, or a frame? Or could it be completely open? His suggestion to a possible solution was retain mind relations between documents, also across modalities, and show them to the user. Guide the user from one information to the next and show her how the data relates to each other. This leads us to the general hypothesis that text-based and content-based retrieval techniques combined with effective visualization and presentation techniques are able to support answering research questions in film science. This would also support film archives to enrich the catalogs, create better metadata, and consequently help with providing better online presentations through curation and facilitate education and research. Linked sources can also help with the identification of film material and identification is a very, very important topic as well for film archives, like contemporary cinema adverts in the daily press. In short, metadata needs to be added, cleaned, and enriched. And I can think of many ways how digital tools and digital humanities could be useful here. So what we want to perform in the end and what we would like to see from a film archives perspective is we want to exchange metadata across film archives and libraries, we want to perform automated, we could perform automated indexing and abstracting. We could import data from relevant web sources. And for film, these are, it could be DBpedia, it could be IMDb, etc. Or we could try and use linked open data. But it would be especially interesting if we strayed a bit from the traditional textual path. Jeffrey Schnapp, for example, mentions video and audio as potential cataloging nodes. For, he talks about three-dimensional objects, but it could also be for film, of course, as for any, or any uh, database record, actually. I think that eventually the catalogs of film archives will transform into media asset management tools, including video as primary sources and other digital representations of the collections alongside the traditional descriptions. The cultural heritage sector only very slowly adapts to these new needs. This is probably something we should save for the discussion, but it is clear that manual cataloging is not the answer. It seems to be common by now to give some facts about the rapidly growing digital content, which is produced daily and can be called our cultural heritage. This is one estimation I've got here. Uh, another one is by Lev Manovich, who estimates that 300 million photos are shared on Facebook every day and 80 million photos on Instagram. These photos are often highly stylized and could be called digital art. And he has done a, a calculation and said that 
uh, 8% of all the photos that were uploaded uh, from London could be really called digital, uh, what we could call digital art. Jeffrey Schnapp put such figures into perspective by stating that, and here's the quote, every two minutes we now take as many photographs as were taken the entire 19th century. For video material, the situation is similar. Luke McKernan, he works at the British Library, writes on his blog, and here's the quote, I estimate that there have been 2.7 billion videos uploaded to YouTube since 2005. 400 hours of video are added to the site every minute. And he compared it to the speed of the average film archives, who, and I quote again, haven't managed to collect more than 400 hours of content in years. Unquote, and they struggle with that a lot, you can trust me. How do we curate that? Uh, what could be preserved and how can we view it? Essentially, what we witness, witness is a paradigm shift from the manual selection by elite experts to a democratic big data model. McKernan aptly describes the current situation the cultural heritage institutions are faced with. And here I have a bit of a lengthy quote, but I think he's, uh, he's actually bringing up something that is, um, that is very revolutionary, for uh, probably unthinkable for cinema curators. And I quote uh, McKernan, vast amounts of this online content is what might be termed trivia, ephemeral videos of skateboarding pets of the kind that would never have been acquired by a film archive, nor even conceived as a type of film production before the YouTube era. But is it trivia? How are we to judge what a moving image should be? Is the understanding of it as an art medium of the best kind, revered in a cinematic, now something absolutely narrow? What intrinsically is the difference between, say, Citizen Kane, and maybe you've heard of Citizen Kane, or think of Casablanca, think of some very, really canonical film, and Charlie Bit My Finger. I don't know if you remember this one. It was really a big uh, YouTube uh, hit at, at that time. And I, uh, I continue with the quote, perhaps we should look only at the numbers, unless it's the numbers that are scaring us, and we prefer to cling to all certainties. Unquote. While a democratization of content, collection, and rethinking traditional curatorial self-conceptions are desirable and necessary, there remains the valid question of meaningful selection. In Jeffrey Schnapp's words, how can we find corpora that matter to a given community or within a given cultural domain, accessible and usable in a meaningful way? In order to select material, we need to find it. And ideally, we need to see a vast amount of data, if not all, to choose from, not only on the internet, but also in our own databases. And I think we have all experienced that this isn't easy. Manovic claims that this is the fault of current interface designs because, and, uh, I quote, popular web interfaces for massive digital media collections, such as list, gallery, grid, and slideshow, do not allow us to see the contents of a whole collection, unquote. Since we cannot view the com complete collection's metadata, either online or on site, and explore it, and I quote again, without any preconceived expectations or hypotheses, a researcher has to postulate beforehand what the important types of information worth seeking out are, unquote. These search strategies have another disadvantage. They do not reveal the context of the objects we are interested in, meaning within the database. For example, which subset do they belong to? Which are the similar objects uh, next to it, and so forth. How can we therefore discover interesting things in massive media collections? How can we browse through them efficiently and uh, effectively without prior knowledge, knowledge of what we want to find? I would like to modify this for the film archivist, and this could be how can we link documents or media which we did not know existed before and were not linked with each other based on their visual properties or metadata. For film studies, we can develop a whole other set of possible questions. So two approaches for this, what I've just been trying to outline here, I would find worth exploring. Firstly, the visualization of objects according to formal visual qualities, and secondly, the integration of user-provided research questions into the retrieval process in such a way that it is driven by the research question. In other words, could narratives, 
serve as a useful way to connect diverse sources in order to gain new film historical insights or pathways through collections. I will focus here only on uh, one of these topics, which is the visualization of media, and I will give you some examples which are all centered within the silent film era. I hope that does not scare you, and mostly based on the work of the Russian director Ziga Vertov. Films are usually analyzed based on their visual properties on one hand and based on their structured sequentiality on the, others, on the other. My own specific research interest lies in how to apply the idea of visualization without reduction to film works, and you will see a couple of uh, images of that later. Meaning basically a radical departure from the traditional visualizations using data derived from transcriptions. However, the formal analysis of filmic structure has a long-standing history in Slavic studies, namely the work of the Russian formalists. In recent times, with enhanced computer power, it is possible, as Manovich claims, to use the full image of a film rather than just statistical data for visualization and aided analysis. So I'll go back in time. I'm, uh, I'm quite shocked sometimes that it's already 10 years ago, and I still talk about this project, um, which was really pre-digital humanities at that time. And I should also say that digital humanities came very late to Austria. Um, certainly when uh, this project was, um, was approved, uh, nobody talked about it then. I still think it's a, it's a good example and it was very, it's, it's valid for the things I would like to, to talk about now. In this project, uh, eight films by the, by the aforementioned Siga Vertov were manually annotated and served as the ground truth for the computer-aided analysis. The general aim was to gain insights into the highly formalized artistic work by the director by applying quantitative and formal analysis as well as close readings and the integration of original documents surviving at the Ziga Vertov collection in the Austrian Film Museum. An interdisciplinary project in its true sense, it turned out that different disciplines, uh, different disciplines, specific goals and methods proved to be a constant challenge for each of the partners. And there were three partners. There was the Theatre, Film and Media Studies Department of the University of Innsbruck, uh, of Vienna, the Technical University of Vienna and the Austrian Film Museum. However, much of what I'll show you in a moment has been the result of my own collaboration with Manovic, which was carried out after the end of the project. Working in a film archive, materiality is one of the keys to understanding historical film elements. So maybe, let's go here, this is probably better. Uh, it's more appropriate for what I'm trying to point that to say here now. Even though Manfred Thaler, which you probably know, has pointed out recently that the core of the humanities, or he actually likes to point this out, the core of the humanities has not been influenced by technological changes like photography, which is certainly true. There are other scholars like Joanna Drucker who states that the pros, and I quote, the process of creation is inherently linked to the artwork, its perception and analysis. So what you'll see here is a, um, is a frame of a, of, a, of, a, of a silent film based on, uh, on uh, the nitrate carrier, which is the oldest carrier here. And this is uh, one of the collections you would find in film archives, which, which are film, but are also non-film. This, um, this was actually collected by, we don't know who really, probably a film projectionist, who cut out frames from the films he was screening and then put, uh, made a collection of it. And you can kind of, you have them in an album and this, sometimes we only have one frame, sometimes four frames. And the identification of these films is very difficult because there are no references. And if you want to uh, look at the project online, please go to the Schlemmer Frames Collection, named after one of uh, our archivists who found this, basically. Just somebody left it at the door, as it op always is. Uh, I, I wanted to show you this here. Uh, mostly to just give you a bit of a maybe tangible idea of how analog film really looks and how it, it can look and what restoration in the film realm can mean. Let's go back to, to film studies and David Bordwell, who is one of the most influential scholars there. 
and uh, and he I think these two quotes underline this uh, this argument of that uh, that we need to look at uh, at uh, the production conditions of films so he talks about film style and how film style is related to how films were produced and here film studies it seems to me is an effort to understand films and the process processes through which they were made and consumed. I would like to now show you finally some examples for these visualizations. So um, I will show you also a video clip later or in a moment uh, of a uh, film by Ziga Werthoff so you can get an idea. Here we have um, single frames of one of his lesser known films, The Eleventh Year from 1928. Ziga Werthoff is really, really a very famous name within, the, within film studies and uh, probably, I don't know if some of you have ever heard of him, but uh, uh, he's really basically a superstar, avant-garde pioneer and, and documentary filmmaker as well. So he, as I said before, he has a very um, highly uh, formalized and, and stylized way of making films and this is why formal analysis really makes sense. Um, to apply. So here, uh, what we've done here is uh, we, work, we worked with image sequences, which is um, we extracted films, uh, we extracted frames from the films and then uh, sorted them by, by brightness. So you have the, the darker frames on the left side and the brighter frames on the, uh, on the left and on the right side here. So these are not all the frames from the films. These are um, always the first uh, frames of, of the shots. So I'm talking about visual patterns here or visual properties. Um, this is a, a film from 1926 by Lotte Reiniger, The Adventures of Prince Ahmed. This is a tinted film. So film was not, black and white film was tinted also at that time. Um, this was a, a recently restored film and I think, uh, so if we have one frame per hundred frames also in the same, uh, extracted in the same way. It's like a snapshot of the film and you can um, kind of look for, obviously for color patterns. And here's just another example where I tried to do, to do the same. This is a, a, a very little Hungarian film, a little known Hungarian film, um, uh, adaption of Oliver Twist. Probably also to give you an idea of different uh, color patterns that you that you can have and you could, you know, there are, uh, there are different ways of, um, of analysis you could think of that you could do here. It's like, for example, compare uh, tinted films across uh, a period or uh, even in different nations. And what you should know also here is that, uh, that films were actually tinted by the, by the distributors, not by the studio. So. Um, for example, they were shipped to, to the US and the US distributor would uh, choose a color pattern. And so I think it would be valid to also uh, think about if there were cultural differences in, uh, in how films were colored at that time. So image composition would be something to explore further. Here's just an example of the historical, uh, one of the historical documents that we have in relation to organizing uh, uh, here is um, the motion in the shot. Uh, this is the famous uh, cameraman Vladimir Nielsen who worked with uh, Sergei Eisenstein. But there are many examples I could give here. This is just this is just one. If we move away from uh, from the visual patterns and go more in in uh, in a montage or in a film structured way, uh, we could do something like this. You would probably think this is not very uh, not very revolutionary, but uh, <laughs> I still think it's a very nice and uh, and fairly easy way to uh, to get an, uh, a snapshot of the whole film. This is uh, again the eleventh year that uh, I mentioned before. It's uh, Ziga Werthoff again, and you have uh, one frame per shot here. So this is always the first uh, frame of the shot. You probably, uh, if we talk about structure of the film, uh, we would think in shorts and then in sequences and in film reels, but this would, uh, bit, uh, we would uh, kind of leave the topic that I wanted to talk about if we would go more into this film historical uh, uh, realm here. So finally, I probably should, uh, should show you a 
film clip. This is uh, Ziga Vertov's most famous film. It's called The Man with the Movie Camera from 1929. And this is the actual speed of the film. You can see that uh, he experiments not only with uh, image composition or montage, but also with uh, time manipulation. Uh, this is a sequence from some, uh, uh, the last third of the film where, where he shows how, uh, how Soviet people spent their, their free time <laughs> by, uh, of course, uh, engaging in amateur sports and, and all sorts of things. I would really advise you to uh, uh, to watch the whole film. It's uh, it's beautiful and it's uh, it's really quite uh, incredible uh, what uh, what people achieved in, in 1929 in terms of uh, of editing and uh, and frame and, and image composition. So you probably also uh, can guess where I would like to draw your attention to is that is this intercutting of the slow motion scenes with the with the audience that is filmed in uh, that is uh, filmed in real time, and here this is the kind of the the high point where he uh, he shows us what you can do with film, and it's a course in, in film production as well. So maybe this is uh, this is enough for the moment. I think you got an idea. So here again, this is the uh, sequence that we just saw, uh, uh, applying the same uh, the same uh, visualization or the same type of. Uh, it's not an analysis. It's just the, you know a snapshot of the film. But I still, uh, I think it shows quite nicely what the, the montage pattern is here, that it's, uh, it kind of confirms our viewing experience, that we kind of, we got an idea that it is uh, intercutting, it's, uh, but, you know, watching the film one time or even ten times uh, can never make you too sure that what you saw is really what, what is in the film. And this is uh, something that appeared quite early on in the Digital Formalism project, that the scholars uh, wanted to have some kind of navigation uh, aid while they were analyzing this film. And this is something that was, uh, was actually not applied in the project, but came out of it then later. Specific visual elements and the position over the course of a film is the, is the next topic. So faces in close-up have a special significance for Ziga Wertov and its time which to explain would divert us too much from the initial topic, as I said before. The important thing to know is that they appeared clustered in few sequences in the 11th year. This is the film I mentioned before, and the short lengths are created in a specific way, which can be visualized in different ways. So I'll, uh, this time I'll show you the film clip before. So this is one, uh, one sequence from the 11th year. It's the film made one year before The Man with the Movie Camera, and they can be seen as, a, as very closely related. I won't, uh, I won't go into too much detail what this film is about. I would just like you to, to look at uh, how this, the faces are presented here and how they are uh, intercut again with, uh, with the main action here, which is this man single-handedly bringing electricity to the, to the countryside. <laughs> yeah, it was him. He was the one. You probably know that there were big electrification projects in the Soviet Union, so it uh, was really a lot of work he had to do. So, of course, this is not uh, only about but these uh, beautiful women, the Soviet women that watch this man performing his task, but it's also about the, 
a creative geography because we get the feeling that they all uh, are gathered around him, which is uh, for sure not the case. So, and this is the end of the sequence. So, I hope you. Um, this gives you an idea of uh, of how Vertov works and the ideas he's trying to get across. So, and uh, and this is the same. Um, it's basically always the same, the same thing. Here we have extracted all the faces in close-up in the 11th year, and we just put them. Uh, this is for the whole film now, but you can see the sequence I've just shown you uh, in the first uh, three rows here. If we, this is again the sequence. Um, of course, it's, it would also be interesting to see how how short or long the shots actually are. So. This is something uh, we've come up with to, to demonstrate this. And you can see here that uh, this is cut out from a visualization. This is the, of the whole film. The whole film can be visualized like this, and this is just something to match it. So underneath one frame, which is always the frame of the first, sh the first sh uh, frame of the shot, you can see the actual frames as a bar underneath the, underneath the image. So what you uh, could see here is that, uh, that uh, first of all, the shots get always shorter, and then especially the shots uh, depicting faces get extremely short. Then. So these are just two other uh, sequences where the images uh, of the faces are clustered, and it's, I would say it's always the same, the same uh, method that he applies here, and this is just a bit of an experiment of uh, different ways to visualize a, a film sequence. So on the top row, you always have underneath you. These are three, uh, three uh, visualizations really combined. So let's look at the, the, f the first two here. Is that from left to right, you see the first frame of the shot and the last frame of the shot and so forth. So you can get an idea about the image uh, composition or the action going on within the shot. And these two, uh, these two here should depict prob uh, basically the same, which is uh, to uh, to show us which shots are uh, have more motion uh, are longer. Now this is about the uh, the length. So here, the longer the shot, the higher up is the image, and this one is the traditional one that we have seen here. I'm still not quite sure about the middle one if it really is. Uh, Intuitive, if you can get that, this is what uh, what we want to express here. But this would be for for some further investigation on which uh, visualizations actually make sense and are understandable. So, um, just very briefly um, to show that I not only worked on on Sigurd if you could basically do this with any uh, film, you can. You can work on, you can extract uh, uh, data from it, image sequen sequences. This is a trailer for a Spione. It's a quite famous film by Fritz Lang. It's, a, as the name suggests, an espionage film. And so uh, this was the same, uh, the same method here to compare first and last frame of the shot to kind of see uh, if, if the action moves, uh, moves a lot or it tends to be quite static. I don't know how much time is. Five minutes. Oh my God. Well, I, well, I can stop any time, but uh, <laughs> I'll probably just uh, just go through very uh, quickly then, uh, because as you can guess here, I wanted to talk about georeferencing uh, and just to point you towards a couple of projects uh, I've come across. Here, this is uh, this is. Um, in German, it's called Wir waren so frei. It's about the fall of the Berlin Wall. This is a project by the Stiftung Deutsche Kinematik in Berlin. Um, it's not. This is uh, this is quite interesting. Let me just get to yeah. So a far more complex project is the recent one on Broadway, where sources from Twitter, Instagram. You have to think of this as a, as interactive, so you can. You can uh, check it out online, then, and I'll give you the I, with my slides. I can provide also the the links, then you can see them. 
So we have sources from Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and other sources. And this project does not include a moving image, but we could probably think along similar ways of presentation, including uh, film images. And I just want to mention a new project, which is called iMedia Cities, has just been granted uh, funding within the Horizon 2020 program, and will present films from nine European archives for research and reuse, but it will not be uh, by far, I think, <laughs> as uh, ambitious as something like this, which actually has been funded by the uh, New York Public Library. Just one more thing, I don't know, maybe you're aware, uh, you're familiar with this one. It's, uh, it's a, a text example again, and it's Ben Fry's interactive chart showing the different versions of Darwin's on the original species. And it's a quite, it's another useful attempt to use spatial visualization. So, and this might be inspiring, I think, for a better presentation of a different version of historical film prints, which is uh, an important and challenging topic in, uh, in the film studies. Of course, uh, film is not a static uh, media, and I think that if we talk about uh, neighboring subjects or where inspiration could come from, I think it would be worth looking also into graphic novels or comics. And I, if you don't know this book by Scott McCloud, Understanding Comets, Comics, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really a very good read, and I find it quite inspiring for, for any analysis in, in film studies as well. So here, um, so here McCloud, for example, an an analyzes how graphical elements organize the story. And he writes that both film and comics are storytelling forms, therefore the relations across the frame are essential. But let's go back to cultural heritage institutions and let me present some examples of visualizations of collections. Two places I get inspiration from are certainly the Meta Lab at Harvard University and the Software, Software Studies Initiative. I have a short video clip here, if we have time, to explain the project uh, Lightbox. We could just have a look. It's a very professionally made uh, a video. Uh, the Meta Lab uh, in Harvard did this together with the Harvard Art uh, Museum, and it shows uh, the digitized collection But the idea is also to show, uh, to show the metadata with it, even down to the, to the very core, as you can see here. These are all the tags and uh, really proper, like, hardcore metadata. And you have all sorts of filtering options. And as you saw before, um, this is all presented on a, on a big video screen. And also Manovich works for all, uh, all the kind of visualization that I've also shown you before with massive video screens. And uh, it does make a lot of sense rather than to, to show it, to show it like this. So, um, this is the last example, and it's again from the New York Public Library, who presents the digital objects also in innovative ways, I think. Um, so you can, you can sort here by colors. You see that uh, the navigation bar here on the, on, the, on the right. So you see here, I don't know if you can read it, the century created the genre collection and color. And if you click on, on one of these little dots here, you get them to the, to the record, and you can see it in, in the full image. So I've singled out only a, a couple of examples, and uh, I would always be happy to hear more. I just don't think there are many, many around from the, from the film archives. Um, and I think I, would, uh, I could probably close here uh, to respect the time and maybe save some of my conclusions also for the for a discussion if we have one thank you <laughs>